it is as necessary for me to be as vigorous in condemning the conditions which cause persons to feel that they must engage in riotous activities as it is for me to condemn riots. I think America must see that riots do not develop out of thin air. Certain conditions continue to exist in our society which must be condemned as vigorously as we condemn riots. In the final analysis, a riot is the language of the unheard. This is where the chase ended, and here is where the questions begin. McDuffie crashed his motorcycle, but some of the wounds he sustained are not consistent with the accident. I think a lot of young people have no idea what McDuffie was. No idea. I, and as a matter of fact, I don't think it. I know it. The older people, it, it has a lasting effect, I think. McDuffie had been visiting a friend, and late that Saturday night was returning from his visitation and uh, was, was speeding. And that drew the attention of the police. They started to chase him. There was uh, an eight minute, eight and a half minute harrowing chase that took place before they had contact with McDuffie. You had also evidence that, and testimony that they had beaten this man when he was handcuffed on the ground with his hands behind his back. People just exploded. It was almost like someone had, had, had gone along and struck a match and threw on something and boom. I think this is one of the worst things that has happened in Miami and I am very, very disappointed that someone was not held responsible for it. scared us. It, uh, it scared white and black people. I know we don't like to say that race plays a part in this, but I'm not going to say it doesn't, because I'm not convinced that it doesn't. Do something with these papers because they starting to turn a little bit. But this tells a story, you know. And I try to give it to my grandchildren, I mean my nieces, but they don't want it. They say it's too hard for them to remember. This was his motorcycle that he was riding. We have mourned. Um, what has happened for so many years. My family is still mourning. Once you start to talk about um, my father passing, my father being beaten by police, um, you think about the days that he was in a hospital, it just really hits nerves in my family. And the emotions start to flow and it brings them right to that moment. I was eight years old. At eight years old, I definitely wouldn't have been ready for what happened to me. If I can shut my eyes and wake up and try it again. I definitely want my daddy back. I would never want to ever live through that tragedy. His name is Arthur Lee McDuffie. I call him Bubba. I loved him so much and I miss him so much. And he was just a busy person. He, you know, he was, he was like the the leader of the family. And when he passed away, we didn't know what to do. I can't even go back to Miami. When I go back to Miami, it's like it hit me right in the face. Arthur was a warm and kind-hearted person. Joyful, loving, kind. He was just great. Personality-wise, was just sweet. 
He was my cherished, and I cherish my saint because he was my love, my one and my only and my first love. So McDuffie is going to be a child of Jim Crow. And it's, that's why it's important, you know, um, among many reasons to understand how this history is changing the city. The riots that hit Miami in May of 1980 are really, you know, 50 years in the making, right? You have not only a number of different problems that are affecting the neighborhoods of Liberty City and Brownsville that go back into the 1940s and 1930s, um, but there's also practices of policing that are afflicting black neighborhoods in Miami that really are from the outset um, problems that are uniquely born by the black neighborhoods of that city. For most people, when they think about Florida, they think about Miami. They think about this beautiful tropical paradise as a part of the continental United States. They think of palm trees and beaches. Uh, they think about vacation and the leisure. And for that reason, people don't associate us with some of the things that are more typical of a Southern state. When in fact, Florida is very consistent uh, when we talk about anti-Black violence, when we talk about the marginalization of African-American communities, you can find all of that in the state and you can find all of that in Miami. When Miami was founded in 1896, uh, Blacks were here in great numbers because of the amount of work available in building the city. Um, there was work available to anybody who wanted to work. And most people think of the Great Migration of, you know, people from Georgia going to the Northeast Coast, Jersey, Philadelphia, um, um, New York, Harlem, et cetera, and then folks from Alabama going to you know, Detroit and Mississippi, Chicago, and, Louisiana out west, but a lot of folks from southern Georgia actually migrated to Miami. And so you had two groups of blacks in Miami in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. You were either from the Bahamas, which means you lived in the Grove, or you were from South Georgia, which means you lived in Overtown. When I went to Miami, I was about eight or nine, and he was two years younger than me. So that's, that's how old he was. Basically, when we first moved from uh, Georgia to Miami uh, when he was attending school you know I had heard so many stories about uh, the kids in Florida and whatever and I always had a uh, not a fear but I always want to be protected for him or whatever and uh, like when he would get out of school or whatever I would kind of stand around on the corner and make sure he got home safely or nobody bothered him or anything like that and my mom's house is always filled with kids. You know, you used to have to step over to get to get to where you need to go. And uh, Bubba was one of those kids. We lived over town on uh, Six Court and Fourteenth Street, and he was this little boy that had a lot of life. You know, he always was busy doing things. You know, sometimes you wish you could go back to childhood days, but. Um, because it was enjoyable. And the neighborhood was, was a, uh, uh, a super neighborhood. People knew each other. People enjoyed uh, uh, the neighborhood. People talked to each other, um, spent time. It just was a joy growing up here in Miami. And the neighborhood was, was a, uh, uh, a super neighborhood. People knew each other played ball, we, we, we had uh, mock races, we would race each other and, and do things like that, um, but it just was, was so cohesive and uh, so friendly, if you will. As we were growing up, we noticed that black people were having it hard from just normally <laughs> making a life of living. He always known that it was hard for black people because he's from the Georgia and back in those times, you know life was hard living and making it in Georgia. So those things, um, they were common for him.
We used to work in the summer, you know, the kids, you know, they'd ask kids to participate in uh, helping to bring in books and put books up and, and what have you. And during that time period, um, you know, we'd be at the school during the summer, we'd be opening up the boxes and be so excited, you know, we're getting new books next year, you know, so, and we got a chance to see the books first. Well, to our surprise, when you open up the boxes for the books, the books are used books from predominantly white schools. That was the system. And people grew up in different worlds and they don't know each other. The only thing they know is what they were taught they're supposed to believe about another group of people. I don't know if you know it, but on 12th Avenue, um, along between, I guess, 62nd Street and 71st Street, there was a huge wall that was at least probably eight, 10 feet. Um, the wall has been torn down. You just see like the bottom of it. But that was the wall that separated the blacks from the whites. It was difficult. It was insulting to know that this is your country, but you're treated as a second-class citizen. You weren't aware of, of so much racism as long as you stayed within that community. It's only when you tried to leave the black community that you were really aware of racism and how, how much it touched your life. Uh, a black person could not operate a business in downtown Miami in the 1930s and 40s and 50s. Uh, even earlier than that, blacks would not even be outside of color town after dark without a pass signed by a white person. You could not go to Crandon Park. You could not go to Key Biscayne without a written uh, permission from somebody that you worked for. I had a job after school working in Hialeah. And at that, in those days, in the 60s, blacks weren't allowed to work in Hialeah without an identification card. Now here I am, a citizen, born in this country, born in this city, raised in this city. My parents were raised in the same city, born in the same city, but I had to get an identification card to say who I was and what I was doing in the city of Hialeah. And you had to produce this ID card anytime um, the police or anybody else asked you. The courthouse, for instance, uh, as a black, you couldn't go inside the courthouse and use the restroom or the water fountains. They had water fountains outside. The restroom was down in the basement. I remember I was about eight years old. My grandmother took me to Rich's department store to buy my Easter suit for me. Well, my, we weren't allowed, blacks weren't allowed to shop on the main floor at, uh, at Rich's department store. We had to go into the basement. We were allowed only to go into the basement and we weren't allowed to try anything on. My grandmother would have to hold the suit up to me to see if it fit. Until people like Father uh, Reverend Graham and um, uh, some of the other ministers and other community people got together, they staged a sit-in uh, at the counter to demand to be able to be served inside. Dr. Brown, what do you hope to accomplish by this demonstration? We hope to eliminate racial discrimination in all public accommodations here in the city of Miami. But there was an incident, um, oh God, I can see his face, I can't call his name, but moved into an area in what we know as Liberty City and had a cross burned on his front lawn. Did anybody sponsor your move into a white neighborhood? No, no one sponsored my move into this neighborhood. As I said before, we moved there because it was a reasonable price and uh, we liked the house and we decided to get it. Arthur was a guy who um, had a lot of confidence in himself, was easy to, to get along with, had an outgoing personality, paid good attention to carrying himself. He was like that in school. You know, he, he was like that in school. He was in the band, and from the band, he was, like I say, the president of the class. And, and, and not just one class, in every class he was in, he was always 
in the president or something, somebody important? I remember uh, when Bubba wanted to date Frederica. I remember he said, I'm going to get that girl with that. I said, what's going on? That girl don't want you. The first moment I met Arthur, there was a harmonious, deep feeling inside of me. And I said to myself, hey, I like this guy. One afternoon, my mother had sent me to the store to buy a small can of peas. And on my way to the store, I seen this guy there, but I decided that I would continue to walk on, even though I know deep inside there was that feeling in me that I wanted to talk with him. And I went in, I bought my can of peas for mom, and on my return back home, standing all alone himself on the corner, I said to myself, I know the question is going to pop up. Truly and surely, he decided to walk along with me. And he said to me, hi. I said, hello. He said, um, where are you going? I said, I'm on my way home now. He said, may I walk with you? I said, sure. So he said, I like you. I said, really? He said, yes. May I talk with you? He said, not right now. I have to go now. So he said, may I have your number? I said, well, yes. And I gave him my number and um, he called me and uh, we talked over the phone. We decided to get married once we both finished high school. But at the meantime, um, Arthur finished high school two years before I did. Arthur served three years in his service, Marines. During the time that he was in the Marines, um, we kept communications through letters and we prepared ourselves, you know, while he was in the service that we would get married once you um, return home and out of the service. One of my proudest moments of him when he the first time he came home, he was dressed in his Marine uniform, and uh, he was, you know, he really looked swell. He got his dress blues, and at that time, the only way you could get a dress blue uniform in the Marine Corps, you had to be an outstanding Marine. He got his dress blues coming out of boot camp, and that's very hard to do. So for you to come out of, the, uh, come out of boot camp and be the only guy out of 20, 25, these 30 guys, uh, you had to be the best in what you did. And he was the only guy, the black guy, that got the dress blues out of all those guys, because I remember that surely. And uh, uh, seeing him in his dress blues just, um, you know, just blew my mind. I knew I wanted to be a Marine then. He was a military MP, just like the police is out in civilian life, but the military police, police just does that. When we met in the Marine Corps, I saw that he was still he was still the same author. I was assigned to the USS Independence, which is an aircraft carrier, as a part of the, uh, the uh, detachment aboard the ship. Uh, Arthur was assigned to the detachment. And um, we spent um, about a year and a half or so in, in that assignment, um, traveled the Mediterranean and um, several other places we went aboard the, aboard the aircraft carrier. And then I didn't come back again until 68 when I got out of the Marine Corps. And, and of course Miami had changed tremendously because I-95 was not here when I left. A very cruel decision was made in the mid-50s and early 1960s uh, having to do with how to bring I-95 into downtown Miami. Uh, the business community, the downtown business establishment, wanted to have that expressway come into downtown Miami as far west as possible to allow for the expansion of downtown to the east. And that meant into Overtown, even though it could have come down the old railroad track. And so the decision was made, despite black protest, 
I mean, the Miami Housing Authority in the mid-1960s deliberately, deliberately chose black neighborhoods to be the recipients of relocation housing from displacement of the interstate highway. They were quite explicit in this respect because their argument was if you put relocation housing into white neighborhoods, well, then those neighborhoods will just go downhill. So we're going to go ahead and concentrate the adverse effects of relocation housing by forcing these buildings onto the actual black suburban neighborhoods that were largely you know, built to escape the poverty of the Central Negro District. And there are you know, these gripping accounts of black people protesting at you know, town hall meetings and forming homeowners associations, creating um, LLCs, you know, limited liability corporations that will, will basically engage in shared ownership of rental property. How long have you lived here? Over 25 years. My father really owns the home. And uh, we really, uh, being an older man, I don't see how he can start all over again. Well, it's then you were brought up here. Yes, I was. Do you have any feelings about the idea of a bulldozer going through the home you were brought up in? Oh, mixed emotions, really. Do you have any idea at all what you'll do if you do have to move, though, where you'll move to? No, we do not have any idea because we haven't been informed. I mean, it's... We've heard over a period of time this was going to happen, but when? <laughs> About the 20th of January, when God sent a great big flood, it run the planters from their beautiful homes. And they had completely destroyed the old town community for the most part because the houses were gone, you know, I-95 coming right down 3rd Avenue. And for those folk who remember, 3rd Avenue was a, a major thoroughfare, particularly for old town, as well as 2nd Avenue. That's where all the activities occurred. You had three or four hotels. You had nightclubs. You had three or four theaters. And all that went away. Lived in a refugee camp or in some tenant's home. You'd learn not to be afraid of ice or fear. You got a lot of people, blacks, who had no place to go, who uh, were in some instances forced by eminent domain out of their homes, those who did own properties. People had to find places to go, you know. The government didn't try to find no places because those places we lived in was like little places, you know, so they wasn't ours. You know, so it was like when the expressway came through, everybody kind of like scattered, you know, different places. So, yeah, you know, it was, it was heartbreaking. It was an incredible displacement of tens of thousands of people in a very short time. And that really explained this rush of people then to Liberty City. We moved from there to um, 7th and 9th Street and um, 22nd Avenue. This is, again, another one of those largely overlooked and unseen conflicts. Um, but it absolutely happened in ways that then set the table for the poverty that would afflict Liberty City with the McDuffie episode. Um, and everything in the city is similarly manicured from one generation to the next. He was discharged from the service and October 5th of 1968, and we married November the 2nd, 1968. It was very nice. She had on a long gown, and um, they went off on a little honeymoon, and then he bought a house. He was kind of interested in police work, as when he got out of the Marines, he applied for Dade County to be a uniformed, you know, patrolman. And uh, for some reason, I don't think the, they called him fast enough. He considered himself a businessman, and he got into 
insurance, selling insurance. To all type of people. Old people. And that was the thing. He liked it to be around old people. You always had conversations, always talking, you know, to old, older people. You know, he just sold insurance to anybody that he could, you know, help get insurance. I guess that's one of the reasons why so many people knew him. In that business, you get to talk to and be around a lot of people. He liked that very well, and uh, that was his goal, was to reach the top or wherever, as far as he could go in that. He was a devoted man. He was a hardworking man. And most of all, a strong provider for the family. He liked to just dance. <laughs> he liked to dance. Um, I watched him dance my mother. I watched him dance by himself. One of their favorite um, songs was by Teddy Pendergrass. <laughs> Turn off the lights and let's light a candle. <laughs> so a lot of times the lights went out and I had to go to bed. And she's always looked at him with these googly eyes. You know, like when he come home, I'm like, you act like you just saw a ghost or something. But that's what made her melt. As long as his car pulled up in the yard, as long as he made it home, um, it was like her world, or their world. He always tried to make me feel like uh, Cinderella. Uh, my linen had to be matching my bed, uh, my curtains. Um, and he always would put like candy, uh, big hearts of candy, and uh, Valentine town cards and stuff on my bed. And that's how I realized that I was really a dance girl. The 1970s is a decade where black people are trying to assert a kind of community control over their institutions and is seen as being a time of great promise. And so even if the realities of segregation are, are lingering, there's a sense that with the end of formal segregation, with the end of uh, voter disenfranchisement, with the arrival of fair housing, it might now finally be time for black people to catch a break and achieve some form of freedom and you know, durable upward mobility. The problem, of course, is that there are still very real consistencies and continuities to the Jim Crow period, and one of them is around policing. So you had to be a member of the Klan to be a Miami police officer. That was actually a requirement in the 1920s, in the 1930s, into the, the, the 40s. They have pictures from the newspapers of uh, white police officers riding city of Miami motorcycles down Flagler Street, Miami dressed in Ku Klux Klan hoods and robes. You know, they didn't just have police power, they had political power. They were the politicians in addition to being the police. The way that the Klan basically gets diminished in Miami has to do in part with the um, arrival of many more ethnic whites to the region, Catholics as well as Jewish Miamians. You have African Americans who, especially during the 1940s and early 50s, are much more effective at getting their own interests represented and reflected in the local political scene. The bigger economic prospects of the region are also in line here because you can't continue to encourage investment from outside parties if you have cross burnings and you have other kinds of markers of over white supremacy. The problem though is that by the time you get to the 1940s and 50s, certain kinds of violent excessive police practices that have been in play for now, you know, 20, 30 years, simply get preserved and maintained. What you see is police forces who are adopted to be the hands and arms 
of the Jim Crow legal system. It's one thing to have a law on the books that said that black people cannot go here or be here. Who's going to enforce those codes? It's going to be local law enforcement. That is your primary responsibility to keep the social order, to keep black people in their place. However, you have to do that. When you look at this history of policing in America and its main thrust, uh, I think you begin to understand the history of the friction between the two. When I first came on, I was told by a, by a trainer, look, look for a black guy driving a, a pickup truck uh, with a couple other workers, maybe the lawns or things like that. Almost all the time they're gonna have tickets they didn't pay or, or, or court appearances they didn't make and there's warrants out for them. And sure enough, that was true. Most, they say half the time anyway. So this was like ingrained to me as a, as a young cop. As time went on, and changes in leadership happened, and uh, civil rights happened, and, and all uh, different mentalities took, took place. By 1980, this had all pretty much changed. Uh, and I was happy to think that all that was gone by 1980 when the McDuffie thing happened. Liberty City was, it was, it was a good place to live. You, your neighbors were all friendly. There were people that had known each other for many, many years. But again, it was patrolled by primarily white police officers. The police in Miami, even before the riot, decades before the riot, the police were seen as, um, as problematic, as being overzealous in black areas, as being disrespectful of black people. And there were was, was some good basis for those kinds of feelings. The police became uh, viewed as occupants, uh, occupiers of the, of the community rather than participants. My, my own brother was beaten by the police department. Um, and it was the same department that I was working for at the time, the public safety department. Um, he was in the hospital for weeks on end. Um, and he sustained um, serious injuries, but he could not recollect what had happened other than that he was stopped by the police, supposedly for a traffic um, infraction. Their perception of the police was very negative that um, they didn't trust the police and that if you had an encounter, that there may be dire consequences. So the sense was that the police were, were advancing the interests of the white community while, while discriminating against blacks in terms of how they were enforcing the law. I was the first African-American female ever hired as an attorney by the Public Safety Department of Miami-Dade County. At the time that I was hired, there were more white lieutenants in the police department, which was a total of 87, and I don't know why I remember that number, but I do, than the total number of black police officers. When I joined the department, the department was a combination of the police department and the, the jails. There were not that many African Americans on the department. Probably every African American knew every other African American on the department. I was assigned as a part of my duties in um, the police legal unit to give advice to internal affairs or to any other department um, or, you know, any other um, division or group within the the police unit um, department that needed advice. And so I would get a call occasionally from like internal affairs. I think that's when I became acquainted with Linda Saunders. I was one of the first women to do patrol for Metro Dade Police Department. And at the time I joined in 72, I was one of five African-American police women, because at the time they had not yet changed the title from police woman to police officer. The PBA, which was the um, Police Benevolence Union, which is kind of the union for police departments, they did not represent uh, African-American officers um, or women for that matter. We started an organization called the Progressive Officers Club uh, in the police department uh, with African-Americans. Um, because there were things that were not happening. There were people not being able to get assignments, get promotions, and things like that. And um, 
we actually end up filing a lawsuit against the department. That was not an easy process. But we were being fought by the uh, PBA at the time. Bobby Jones, acting director of the Dade Public Safety Department and members of the Progressive Officers Club, today announced the terms of an agreement which guarantees fair employment and promotion for black and other minority officers within the police department. The settlement grew out of a lawsuit filed against Dade County by the black officers in 1976. It's been a long, hard battle for us, but we're not concerned so much about what we're going to get today, but we're concerned about making the department a place where everyone would enjoy working as police officers, a department that the community can be very proud of. And we hope that the impact that this settlement will have on the department and on the community will be one that we'll all be proud of. Well, um, at the time of the incident, I was assigned to the public affairs unit of Miami-Dade Police. One of the internal affairs investigators uh, came over to the office and said to me, she had a, a case that she thought might be of concern. And we, you know, we started talking and I said, well, what's the case about? And she said, it's about a, a motorcyclist who um, our officers were involved with um, a use of force. And you know, you, your first thought is, okay, use of force, you know, what they, they tussle with him to get him. And I said, so what happened? And she explained to me that this person, the motorcyclist, um, had been killed. And um, I said, so do we know who the victim is yet? And she said to me, yeah, we, we've identified the victim. I said, okay. Um, and I asked her, who, what was the name of the victim? So I'm sitting there taking notes. So in case I got, I got to do a press release. And, and she said, the last name is uh, McDuffie. I said, OK. And then all of a sudden, it just sort of hit me. I, I, for whatever reason, I don't know. It just sort of hit me. I said, well, what's the victim's first name? And she said, Arthur. I had to pause. Because I needed her to tell me more about this Arthur McDuffie. What essentially happened, you had uh, Mr. McDuffie who was riding a motorcycle, two o'clock in the morning. He stopped at a red light, but there was nobody around. Two o'clock in the morning, no, no cars. So he sped from the red light, popped a wheelie, which is riding the motorcycle on the back, lead, back tire for a little bit of distance, not thinking anybody's there. Then all of a sudden, Sergeant Diggs, one of the supervisors, gave chase and they chased him around the city, uh, wound up at an entrance to the expressway. Mr. McDuffie, realizing he couldn't, there was a sharp turn, that he couldn't maneuver that turn, he stopped the motorcycle, put the, the kickstand down. First officer to him was an officer named Meyer. He was a relatively young, new officer. Um, he approached him with his hands up. Meyer pulled his gun, stopped. McDuffie held his hands up. Well, at, by this time, you had any number of police cars arriving. They all jumped out of the car. 
and rushed him and subsequently began to beat him and they talk about nightsticks they don't really, not only did they have nightsticks they used something called a kill light but this is a flashlight that's very long that's about a foot and a half and it has a heavy uh, light orb and beat him to virtually unconsciousness I always told my mom, I said, if he could have just made it to the house, he lived on 34th and 12th, he got, that happened on 36th and 2nd Avenue. I said, mom, he was trying to get home. He was just trying to get home. He's trying to get home. And that place where they beat him, beat him down at, I had to go by that place every day, right on 36th Street and Miami Avenue, right by the expressway right there, where they caught him and beat me. Every day, going back home or coming to work, I would go by that place. For 20 some years, I would go by it. And every time I go by that place, I never think about it. Every time I got off the expressway on Miami Avenue and, and 36th Street, I'd have to read my book. I'd have to read my book. It is still happening. It's 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 safe. The very same hospital Arthur was admitted to, it's the hospital where I worked which is Jackson Memorial Hospital. And while I was at work, which was two o'clock in the morning, I was in a patient's room, happened to be standing to the window, and I looked out and I seen an ambulance coming by, um, forwarding to the uh, emergency room, and I said to myself, well, someone is coming in, not knowing that at the same time that it was Arthur coming in. Never did I think any more about the patient, nor did I think of Arthur. I was the uncalled sergeant that night, and I received the call. Based on my previous experience in working in internal affairs, I knew that officers often would collude and get their story straight, if you would, before they met with internal affairs. I told the sergeants and people that were involved, they identified nobody goes home until I get a chance to interview you. Now, it's interesting, the report shows, and this is factual, the incident happened at two in the morning. I was not called until six in the morning. So, from two to six, these officers and supervisors orchestrated a major cover-up. Their stories were just so in sync, and that rarely happens. Rarely do you have them almost using the same verbiage in their statements. What the officers put in the report is that um, he was speeding, and he attempted to make a turn, and as he attempted to make the turn, the motorcycle, um, he had an accident, and the motorcycle hit the ground, his helmet came off, his head hit the ground, and it skidded on its side. And then when they approached him to um, make the arrest for speeding and reckless driving and so forth and so on, um, he jumped up and began to fight like a madman. I think that that was the words they used in their statement. I came home, I think I was in the third grade, and it was a letter on the door. And the, the letter said, um, contact uh, Jackson Hospital or contact one of his insurance partners. It was, it was a real small paper, but you could tell whoever wrote it, they were in a hurry. So I let myself inside the house. 
the hospital called me and they asked me several questions over the phone. Immediately, they needed me to come to the hospital. As my kid arrived from school, I drove to the hospital. There was four hours before I seen Arthur. When I did see Arthur, it was like, no, this is not Arthur. Arthur's head was so swollen. There is no features in his face at all. Arthur's eyes were totally popped out. The neck was no where to be found on Arthur. I mean, it was just totally swollen all up. Arthur's body was more bruises and more scratches from the ground was just totally all over his legs and his arms and the total body movement was just just a jerk movement and I'm saying to myself no accident could look like this the doctor said that we bolted we had to go in in his head and put bolts in his head to release the pressure that was floating around the brains. I remember sitting, I believe it was West Wayne. It was a West Wayne floor at Jackson and he was in the um, intensive care and there, that door was opening up, revolving like maybe for three days. And I just seen so many people kept coming out the door crying. And I still didn't know what was going on. I still didn't have any answers. I just knew that that's where he was. My mother was really devastated. Um, she was devastated. She was the one who, when this happened, they put him in the hospital as John Doe. They beat him and put him in that John Doe. So mother, was the one who went to the street where they say this happened and, and searched around to see if she could find anything because she felt like something was wrong. I have learned that one of the trips here led investigators to the discovery of a set of keys, keys which belonged to Arthur McDuffie. They were not found over there where McDuffie was allegedly beaten, but instead were found upon the rooftop of a nearby building, indicating that someone deliberately threw them there in what is thought to be an attempt to ensure that Arthur McDuffie's identity would remain a secret. Once I've actually heard the actual word that he was dead and gone forever, my heart was broken, torn apart. The only love, the first love, it's gone. No more. No return. Forever. It's away from home. He actually was deceased on the scene when it first happened. I mean, his head was crushed in, uh, and he had to be on life supports to have any sign of life at all. When he was killed, he was on the ground with his hands cuffed behind his back and his head resting on the curb, on the curb. And one of the officers, Alex Marrero, straddled Mr. McDuffie and used his long flashlight to come down and strike him uh, on the back of his head. And because his head couldn't recall, it split his skull. Well, it later turned out that um, it was the medical examiner's office that um, told the police department that the wounds that Mr. McDuffie suffered were inconsistent with the police reports that were written. Dr. Wright, what made you decide that the, the death of Arthur McDuffie was not the result of a traffic accident? The correlation of his injuries with the scene examination and the examination of the bicycle clearly indicated that he was beaten to death. He had no injuries from an accident falling off his motorcycle or, or wrecking the motorcycle? No significant injuries whatsoever. What did he die from? He died as a result of blunt head injuries with destruction of his underlying brain. He was beaten to death. 
the most severe wound is the one which is between his eyes, fractured his skull, and literally destroyed his brain. How hard would someone have to hit someone to inflict such an injury? Amazingly hard. There's a clip that, that plays in my head time and time again. My grandmother is weeping, and she just repeatedly says, they beat him like a doll. They beat him like a doll. They beat him like a doll. Terrible. They beat my child to death. They beat him to death like a dog. Just like a dog. They beat him to death. They beat up his head like a dog. <laughs> they beat the child to death. <laughs> I didn't leave him. I didn't have nobody to do nothing for him. Nobody to do nothing for him. And, and it's something that resonates with our family because at that time, when she was interviewed, that was the first thing that everyone kind of clung to and really heard. That's what the people heard. They, 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 they heard the the discouragement in her voice, they heard the disappointment and the um, just the disheartenment in her voice. We had SOP documents or standards or manuals that says very specifically, anytime a person is considered critical or could die as a result of wounds or uh, activity dealing with a police officer, and that person could likely die, it, it just, uh, automatically belongs as a homicide case from day one. A dozen cops involved in beating up a guy until he died in the middle of the night, and the head of the police division didn't even know the incident had even occurred. It was a, a woman named Edna Buchanan. Edna Buchanan was a high-powered Female reporter from Miami Herald, very bright, very quick. Edna had great sources at the medical examiner's office. So she got the word somehow about McDuffie being declared deceased. So the, the right person for her to call would be Charlie Black, the head of the police division. So she calls the, uh, Charlie Black up at home at night. Now this is four days later. She says to Black, what do you know about this guy named Arthur McDuffie? And Black says, Arthur who? Arthur McDuffie, he got beat up by the police and now he's dead. And Black is, now he was really angry. And, uh, and the first person Black called was me. Then he died. Um, it was, I was with family getting ready to celebrate Christmas holiday. I got a call and one was that McDuffie died, and I literally remember crying. I do remember I cried. My family wanted to know why was I crying. And I said to them, they killed him. They killed him. Um, it still brings an emotional response for me. Because uh, I was a police officer, I sworn to carry out a mission to protect and serve the community, just as those officers had. And that was an ultimate betrayal. I was almost embarrassed to be an officer, part of an agency that would this kind of thing could happen. Um, emotionally, it was very draining. The reality, there were no black officers on the scene uh, that night at all, from City of Miami or Metro Dade. The only black people involved was Mr. McDuffie and me. And Mr. McDuffie died. I learned from Marshal Frank and the other supervisors and brasses around that Godwalla, who had worked with City of Miami, when he learned that this man had died, he resigned and then he came forward to say there was no accident. between those four hours between the incident and them calling me, this is what was occurring. The cover-up came when uh, Sergeant Evans, who was not initially on the scene, 
he came after the beating. And they realized that they had really hurt this man. Decided they were going to orchestrate and make it appear as though his injuries came from the fall in the motorcycle accident. Godwalla, when he got there, was in the early stages of them deciding this cover-up. He saw the motorcycle standing, you know, and watched them knock the damn thing down, saw somebody take the helmet and hit the helmet on the ground to try to make it look like the helmet would have hit the ground and then popped off. But one of the our prime officers involved, and I think it was Hanlon, involved in the beating who knew they were in trouble. Hanlon got in the car and drove over the motorcycle. So they towed the motorcycle away from the scene to uh, an impound lot. And Eric Seaman said, if a motorcycle goes down, there's certain damage that needs to happen. He went to the impound lot, which was locked, once the guy uh, brought the motorcycle in, jumped the fence, and proceeded to hit it with his kel light to make the damage look as though the motorcycle went down. So we, got, we went and looked at the motorcycle for damages and things like that. And you, can, you didn't have to be a, a, an expert policeman or forensic uh, giant to understand that this motorcycle didn't go down and skid and run into something. This motorcycle was, was hit with sticks or, or batons and flashlights, you know, just to give it dents. We were still hustling, bustling, and one day Viverka just walks in my office and he has, he has blue copies of this report. And he says, I want to talk to you. I, I didn't even have to give him his rights. He just wanted to talk to me. And I knew who he was, and I knew his dad. His father had been a, a long time police officer on the department. And then he had Mark Meyer with him. He was shrewd. He knew that they were caught, and he was one of the first ones to come in and say, I'll talk, but I need immunity. The one thing I was concerned with was, this, was this report a lie? Was it really a lie? And Viverka presented it as a lie, because he said he was told a lie by his boss, the sergeant. Janet Reno then was the head state attorney. From there, uh, it was working with the state attorney's office. We have filed charges today against five officers of the Public Safety Department as a result of the tragic killing of Mr. Arthur McDuffie and the ensuing effort to cover up the circumstances surrounding it. Four Dade County policemen were charged with manslaughter. Sergeant Ira Diggs, Officer Alex Marrero, Officer William Hanlon, and Officer Michael Watts. Sergeant Herbert Evans was charged with tampering with evidence and being an accessory after the fact. The McDuffie homicide has opened the largest police brutality investigation in Dade County's history. Sergeant Ira Diggs and officers Michael Watts, Alex Marrero, and Charles Viverka have 47 complaints on their records, 12 involving physical force. None were ever convicted of brutality. Now they face possible murder charges. Oh, when I come to die, Jesus, take me home. I think the two hardest times was hearing what happened and then seeing the, uh, being at the, the funeral itself. Very difficult. Um, yeah, very difficult. But it was, uh, it was a, an excellent homegoing service for me. Sad. The funeral was quite sad. To walk behind someone you really deeply love, to sit and face someone you really deeply cherish and spent moments and days of time with. It's just like saying everything and all in all is inside of me. Jesus gonna make
I felt the need to protest because I felt angry and I felt sad for what had happened to Mr. McDuff and his family. And I felt vulnerable. I felt that if it could happen to him, it could happen to me. A lot of people felt that way. That McDuffie was not a criminal, no history of violence, former Marine Corps corporal, uh, and the only thing he was guilty of was speeding uh, on his motorcycle. So that was a sense that if that could happen to him, it could happen to any of us. So it really made for a collective sense of endangerment, of vulnerability of our blacks. And I think that promoted a lot of us to get out and protest. We were going through some trying times as a as an overall community then, because we were dealing with the Mariel boat lift, I believe it was during that time. We had an influx of uh, uh, from Haiti, and politically, there were a lot of little things going on that affected the communities in terms of representation, and, and things just were not cohesive, if you will, at the time. In the late 1970s, 1978, 1979 in particular, there were a number of incidents with the police and blacks that laid the groundwork for this riot in 1980. Uh, one of the things that upset people most was an incident involving a white Florida Highway Patrolman who uh, stopped a little black girl in South Bay County. She must have been around 10 or 11 told her that she looked like someone who'd been reported to have stolen some candy. He put this child in his car in the back seat, drove to uh, an isolated area, moved into the back seat with this child, began fondling her. She resisted and cried, but he still uh, uh, proceeded to follow her. Because she was crying, he stopped, drove her to her house, and told her not to tell anybody and to keep the sink between them. The girl eventually told her aunt, she was living with her aunt and uncle at the time, what had happened. Within hours, the highway patrol had officers at the house. The child remembered the man's name on the visor in his car, and it was Jones. And within minutes, the police knew who this officer was. The girl identified him photographically. I, I guess the thing, the thing that outrages us uh, primarily is the fact that this man was a, a state trooper using uh, his office, his um, his car, his uniform, to uh, to uh, place a child in a very compromising position, and we teach our children to trust the police, and uh, this makes this kind of an incident particularly abhorrent. Uh, a deal was worked out with the child's family and this man to uh, pay uh, for her mental health and some other minor amount of money. Uh, that was the, the agreement. Uh, he left, he ran away, we don't know where he is today, never did anything to restore this girl's mental health. Another incident involved a young man, a black man named Randy Heath, who was urinating in the warehouse area of the Hylia. He was with his sister or some other relative, stopped the car, and while he was in the process of relieving himself, he was approached by a white police officer, who put his revolver to the man's head and told him not to move, but well, Randy turned his head, and the gun went off and blew his brains out. For months, the black community has been closely watching the Larry Shockley case. Shockley, appearing last week before the Dade Grand Jury, was suspected of manslaughter in the death of Ray Heath, a black man that Shockley thought was robbing a Hialeah warehouse. The Grand Jury yesterday said there was not enough evidence to indict Shockley, and that decision has outraged black community leaders. An officer admitted having made a mistake and then for the grand jury to be able to walk away and say even though even though they felt there was cause they could not find sufficient cause to indict him i think it's an indictment on the black community and i think that the black community is slowly but surely coming into the knowledge of the fact that we are just a forgotten people in this area then there was the lafleur case Mr. LaFleur was a Dade County teacher, school teacher, uh, and the police raided his house looking for drugs. Turns out it was the wrong house, but Mr. LaFleur was beaten severely. He eventually died some years later of his injuries. But the wrong house raid, as it was called, also incensed the community. Uh, 
the most prominent black person in Miami Dade County at the time was the, was the black Dade County School Superintendent, Dr. Johnny L. Jones. Uh, he was big. He was a powerful man. Uh, he was good. But he was convicted of stealing money from the school system to provide gold plumbing, plated plumbing in a private home he was building in Naples, Florida. A lot of folks felt that he was uh, uh, charged and prosecuted because he was black, because he was too powerful. His trial was covered uh, gavel to gavel. People followed it very, very closely. And in the end, there was a sense among blacks that he had been railroaded because he was black. So these things were fermenting in the black community before the incident in which McDuffie was killed in December of 1979. What is clear to me, having worked on this, you know, for over a decade, is that Miami's past really is America's future, right? What Miami's past shows you is that even with linguistic diversity, cultural diversity, with, you know, any number of residential communities that have, you know, people from around the world occupying them, you still have a very consistent white over black social order. Now that white may include people from Cuba, Argentina, Jewish Americans, Anglo-Americans, that black may include black Cubans, Haitians, Jamaicans, African-Americans, but the data on this is absolutely clear that the biggest variable in determining your fortunes in Miami is whether or not you are black. The, the way that the, the region was behaving through the 1970s into the 80s was as if somehow, you know, there wasn't going to be any need to kind of, you know, go back and address the problems of the color line because Miami was a multicultural and cosmopolitan city. So that argument was developing and it certainly was in the interest of local boosters to develop that argument as, you know, investment in the 70s in Miami Beach was flagging and the like. You have this expectation and anger really on the part of African Americans that we have never gotten the true promises from the civil rights movement. Now you're talking about 10 years after the Fair Housing Act and housing is still a problem. You're talking about, you know, more than a decade since the Voting Rights Act and the, the reality of black political power in the city had not been realized. And I think times were just so bad for the black community. Um, um, no elected officials, you know, not owning anything, schools deteriorating. Um, you, we had that one powerful position and you just removed him, the superintendent, even though, you know, what he was accused of was egregious. I mean, the, the, the fact is, is that the one person we had that was in power um, has now been disgraced. So I just think the community was on a boiling point. And I think everybody knew that um, we had to stand up. The McDuffie episode is one that is, you know, absolutely going to erupt in Liberty City because that's the most concentrated place of black disempowerment and ongoing segregation. There had to be some change that dealt, not only just dealt with law enforcement, and, but there had to be some change with access to, to, to self-govern. There had to be change for economic opportunity. There had to be change for better housing opportunity. And our educational system, our schools, had to do better. Ms. Reno assigned the McDuffie um, police officers prosecution to Hank Adorno and George Yoss. And in fact, I was the intern for George Yoss. And they were the, the rock stars, the superstars of the state attorney's office as far as the prosecution of major cases. We intend to do everything possible and appropriate to, to obtain a conviction. If we obtain a conviction, we will be seeking the maximum sentence. If we get these people sentenced after conviction, we will hope that the parole commission would not parole them. All of the detail about what occurred had been reported in the newspaper over and over and over again. But when all that stuff went into the media, it was building the case for 
um, the defense attorneys to say, change a venue. And if the venue got changed, I just knew in my gut that they were going to take it someplace where um, they didn't understand the impact of that case on the community, and they didn't care. Just moments ago, Judge Lenore Nesbitt granted a change of venue in the Arthur McDuffie murder trial. Judge Nesbitt made her opinion based on all that she had heard today in her courtroom when the attorneys for the six former Metro police officers charged in the death of Arthur McDuffie asked for the change of venue. Subpoenas were served to both major newspapers and to the three major television stations here in Miami, ordering that all stories pertaining to the case be turned over to the court as evidence of the large amount of coverage that this case has received. The word McDuffie has become become a byword. It has become a word to symbolize terrorism. It's become a word to symbolize white police officers who beat up our black citizens, lying police officers, police brutality. It has created an all pervasive atmosphere or attitude that many white policemen are racists and liars, beat up on our black citizens. The word McDuffie has connoted racial and anti-police feelings in the community. And the case needed to be tried in the Miami uh, Dade County area because that was the community most affected. <laughs> I think for a lot of us, when the trial got moved, a lot of us said, oops, it might not be a victory here. So when I went up to the trial in Hillsborough County, which is the Tampa area, um, very conservative area, predominantly white at the time, and I sat in that witness box and looked at that jury, all white middle-aged men, and my heart sank. They weren't listening. You know, most of the time you look at a jury, you can see people are intense and they're writing notes. They weren't writing notes. Some were yawning, kind of looking at the ceiling. And then I began to ask, where is my mom? And they said that she's in Tampa. I discovered that I would not be seeing my mama for a while. So I never saw my mom. It's like three or four weeks, maybe to a month. I knew she was calling and she was talking to different people, but me and her never talked. Just alone, the attitude uh, of the people in Tampa, some of the restaurants that we would go in to eat, even the hotel that we were staying in, when we'd walk in the lobby, I mean, everybody, I mean, they knew us without even, you know, I mean, people in that town just, uh, <laughs> they just knew us everywhere we went. We go to Burger King, they know us. We go to eat breakfast, they know us. And I mean, they were just, and really, I was afraid of the people in the town. The evidence is going to show at this point, Arthur McDuffie wasn't talking, he wasn't saying anything, he wasn't moving, he wasn't fighting, he wasn't doing anything. He especially wasn't reaching for anybody's gun. And the evidence is going to show right there. That this man, Alice Morello, excuse me, Alice Morello declared one sided war against Arthur McDuffie. And he stood there over him with the man handcuffed and his hands behind his back and picked up his nightstick and Kellite over his head and struck him right on the head. Not once, not twice, but three times. And the second time he struck him, he struck him so hard that blood splattered in excess of four feet away. There's no tighter fraternity than a police fraternity. But there's a code. Thank God all of them don't live by the code. And the evidence is going to show that these people live by the code. And Skip Evans was teaching the code. And that was, you don't turn in another fellow officer. You don't rat on a cop. And I was in the code house, and I couldn't... You couldn't cry, you couldn't do anything in the courthouse because they was having a trial. So they told us, uh, Janet Reno told us that we couldn't show no emotion while we was in there. And um, all of them had to testify 
Well, them police got up there and they lied. And they said that that he was on drugs. They lied, said he was on drugs. But the really bad, the really uh, testimony that really upset me was the most was the medical examiner. Because he told what happened and how my brother died. And that was devastating to the, to me and the family. His head was so damaged, and so his head was was um was had done like he fell from a five story building. And how could anybody live through that? You know. And the medical examiner was up and was in the courthouse explaining that. And my mother had to sit through that. And me too. All the family had to sit through. It was me, my mother, my sister, and uh, my other brother. He passed away too, because he was so tore up. My older brother, he never got over it. Based on what happened, the testimony and the evidence, and the fact that you had some officers who uh, allegedly did not in, uh, participate in the actual beating, were willing to testify and what have you. With all that surrounding that, there was a common belief that there's no way that all these guys would get off. That somebody was going to get convicted. You think about what it is that was alleged to have happened. If it happened, destroys the criminal justice system in Dade County. What could be worse than sworn officers covering for themselves? I can't think of anything. We were right. We were to be concerned about the, the outcome. It took three weeks to find a jury here. It took four weeks to hear all the arguments and the evidence, but it took the jury less than three hours to reach the verdict. The six members of the all-white male jury left the courtroom at 11.30. Two hours and 40 minutes later, they signaled a verdict was at hand. We, the jury at Tampa, Pennsylvania County, this Saturday, Saturday, May 1980, by the defendant, Michael Watts, asked to manslaughter as charge of count two of the information, not guilty. So say we all, David H. Fisher, former. I thought it was a joke when it started. And I don't think it should have ever gotten this far in the first place. As the truth came out, and thank God, this country still has people who are honest and can base their opinion on the truth. Well, the black community is going to feel very remorseful about this, but I don't see why. The truth came out, and we're going to have to live with the truth. If people can't live with the truth, then what are we going to live with? I got the beep, the beeper went off about the um, um, the verdict. Reached out, and the verdict came back not guilty on, on all. I, I, I couldn't believe it. I, went back and I whispered to the uh, director at the time. I told him, I said, you're not gonna believe this. I said, the verdict is back and it's not guilty. And he said, you gotta be BSing me. No, oh, sir. I said, as a matter of fact, we need to leave now 
and you need to activate the emergency operations plan. And he said to me, he said, really? You think so? I said, no, I know so. I said, it's not gonna be pretty. I was, uh, I was on 62nd and right off of 7th Avenue, my girlfriend, Nisi, I, I was at her apartment and uh, somebody from down, she stayed on the second floor, somebody on the first floor said, they got the verdict, they got the verdict. Everybody doors open. And I said, oh, DC, I got to go home. I got to get home. I said, cause it's, for the, it's gonna, for it. I got to get home. And by the time I came down those steps, 62nd and by 7th Avenue, it was like, it was total, it was less than 30 minutes. It was like, whoa. So I remember the first night, uh, a group of people were down uh, at the Metro Justice Building on uh, 12th Avenue and 13th Street. People were giving very passionate speeches. Um, people had all kinds of signs and making all kinds of noise. The crowd just kept getting larger and larger and larger. And then you would see incidents of stuff where you knew it was just only a matter of time before something big happened. And you saw the police sort of standing around ready to break up the crowd and, and tear gas. Um, and then you knew that um, this was really, really gonna be bad. Today, several decisions were handed down in Tampa that shocked many of us, turned a lot of us apart inside, and made us extremely emotional. Somehow, in this town, black people must be able to deal with this in an orderly fashion. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Now, there were 40 officers on motors in those days, 40, 45 officers on motors in those days. They had each one of us come down to get a shotgun. They issued a shotgun and four rounds of ammunition. Frank Christmas and myself were the only two black police officers on the squad at that time. And guess what? We were the last two in line, and they ran out of shotguns. We didn't get a shotgun. Frank and I were given riot batons to be on the street that night. A couple hours later, I got a call from a reporter for asking me if I knew that whites were being attacked uh, on 62nd Street in Liberty City. I got in my car and drove up to Liberty City to 62nd Street, about 12th Avenue, that had been shut off by that time by the police to prevent white people from going into this area and into danger. And then uh, a, a, a car driven by uh, a white young man got through the western end of the blocked off the street because the police had temporarily left that position and the car drove into the heart of this growing riot. Um, people started throwing rocks, bricks, bottles at the car. I think Jeffrey Culp was a young man who was driving his car, his brother. These were young men uh, in the car with him and a 15 year old uh, white girl, Deborah Getman, in the back seat. So the, the, the car lost control, the cop lost control of the car, swerved across the median, and struck Shamika Perry, who was, a, I think, an 11-year-old a black girl at the time, smashed her against the wall of one of the buildings, severed her leg cleanly. Some people took the child, put her in a taxi, put the leg, wrapped it in a, some sheets that took off a clothesline, put that in the trunk of the car, put the girl in with a relative and drove her. She was driven to Jackson Hospital. She survived. She's an amputee today. That event, when Shamika was struck by that car, set off a frenzy of anger and violence against these two black bo white boys. Um, when I got there, there were about 15 or 20 young black men surrounding one of the boys, 
who was on the ground, had dripped, dragged out of the car by that time. And they were beating him and kicking him and using a Miami Herald newspaper dispenser. These boxes you see on the streets, they were crashing it down on his head repeatedly. And I'm watching this. In real time, I'm watching these, these, this mob kill this boy. So what do you do? Then I heard somebody say, we're going to get Uncle Tom niggas next. And I knew they were talking about me, people like me, who supposedly black leaders who they felt had failed them. One, one survived. He's very severely injured today. The other died. And Deborah Getman was saved by some of the residents of that housing project who hid her until a cab could be stopped and drove her out of the riot area. And that was the beginning of the worst day in Miami history. And when you have communities that, that have been neglected for so long and nothing is being done about it, then people tend to react. Of one after the other of what people viewed as an unjustified shooting and unjustified killing. And after being exposed to that over and over and over again, that anger, it builds up in you. Okay, they're emotional, and anything that looked like it might be Caucasian, you're throwing bricks and rock and shoot. And shoot? And, and shooting, they're for real. They're guns out there. There are two Caucasians that are laying in the middle of the street right now. Two people are laying down right now in the middle of the street. Don't go up in there. Matter of fact, you're, you're too close. I'm you, you all are too close. There was people, they were on the side of the road, and then they jumped out in front of us, and we stopped the car, and everybody just started throwing at us, and I didn't see any, I, I thought they were just crossing the street. And the girl that was sitting in back of me, she ducked, but she, she didn't scream to me to duck, and they just threw a bottle right at my neck. And so we took a side street, and there were people just laughing at us, and nobody even cared to stop and help us or anything. I was standing in my office at the headquarters building. Matter of fact, I was talking to the director on the phone. I say, well, I think the stuff is about to hit the fan because I'm looking out my window down 14th Street, coming from 12th Avenue. The largest number of African Americans I've ever seen in one spot and they're not happy. A group of people came in front of the headquarters building and, and stopped. And I think what they were about to do was to try to come in there. Five-story building, uh, which was the, the heartbeat of the whole police agency, okay? The crime lab was there, all the records were there, communications, dispatch was there, detectives, uh, administration, everything was there. There was a, a, a dunkometer officer, an older man, and, a, and a, a woman police officer that was sitting at the front desk when he walked in the uh, police station. The rest of the police station was uninhabited almost, except for the detectives on the second floor where I was. They got into the building in the lobby. They faced these two older people and they were angry. You can see they were angry and they were ready to like destroy the police headquarters. Would have been a bad move. So I went downstairs and I recognized some people and I said, look, you don't want to do that. I said, because I'm going to tell you, if you come in, you're not going out the way you came in. So they went back out, went down the street, went around the corner, and they went in front of the Justice Building. And I think that's where the first vehicle was, was torched. All the communications for, for, for police would have come to an end. All the records would have been destroyed. Arrest records, police records, report records, everything would have been gone. 
dispatchers would, would, would no longer be dispatching, uh, not, at least that night or many days to come. The people, there would be no, no one answering calls for police. The department would have been frozen had these guys taken over the building. And there was enough of them to be able to do that. A white police officer uh, drove over in a brand new car and started telling people to disperse. He had a brand new police car. Uh, they took him out of the car, flipped the car over on its roof and burned it. We had something we called stomp and drag. And it was, the, the, the fact of stomp and drag is supposed to, it's supposed to be a show of force and it's supposed to be a tactic that, uh, that intimidates the crowd. And we were stomping and dragging. You could see us and you could hear us. They started throwing things at us and we realized that we were gonna be outnumbered and if they really rushed us and decided to surround us, we couldn't do anything about it, so we had to retreat. When this rioting and stuff happened, so many people knew him and knew the kind of person he was, they were just upset. Uh, the way that uh, he was handled and the things that they did to him was just was not, it just was not right. It just didn't sit right with the people and uh, they knew the kind of person he was and they, they knew it was unfair for them to just, just do that to him. I'm from the advisory committee of your county manager and I came over here to try to help bring the peace about for what they have created out here, okay? These nothings here, these pigs, these are pigs out here, these policemen are pigs. These guys have done their dirt, they have taken McDuffie, they've killed him. These people asked for justice, they've taken Johnny Jones, they've crucified him under white jury. This stuff doesn't make sense. These people want justice and I don't blame them. The leadership, where these people are, everybody have gone in their cubby holes. I say Reno and your county manager need to come out them holes and let's go to the round table because to release these cops without these people having an explanation is no good. There were a lot of people that didn't appreciate seeing black police officers out there either. Uh, I had things thrown at me. And I remember talking with one black supervisor who said, I understand the impact and how difficult it is, but we still have a job to do. He had a difficulty persuading the blacks who he supervised to come to work. I was sympathetic, and I'll tell you the truth, if I hadn't been a policeman, I might have been over there with them. Throughout the night, we didn't get an opportunity for a single nap. We would go from one fire to the next fire, to the next fire, to the next fire. We were relieved uh, the next morning by the next shift, and we were advised, you better go home and get as much sleep as you can because there's a likelihood that you're gonna be called back in the evening. And lo and behold, we were called back in the evening. And again, we responded from fire, one fire to the next fire to the next fire. The fire department would respond to a, a, a fire and it'd be pelted with rocks and everything else. The fire department wouldn't go to any fire unless it had a police escort. Obviously, that was uh, one of the reasons why. We've seen all sorts of major trauma from gunshot wounds, stab wounds, people beating up every parts of the body from the head, abdomen, chest, you name it, it's happened. I mean, things were happening so fast in so many different locations, it became difficult to keep up with them and respond to them. We've asked the governor to release a third battalion. The governor's office has now told us that there will be 1,200 state uh, people between troopers and the National Guard and other law enforcement uh, agents of the state to, to supplement our 750 uh, police department and Metropolitan Dade County's 2,000. So uh, I, I think uh, well, those men evidently uh, might be needed the way this thing is shaping up. I remember one night we had to respond to uh, a fire they had, and that was over on 27th Avenue and 54th Street. Someone, vandals had set the place on fire, and there were, you know, several hundred thousand tires, and it made quite a fire. It was hard to extinguish. The Norton Tire Company, in the midst of McDuffie riots, it set on fire. It had been uh, a major employer of African Americans in the community. And people look at that and said, you shot yourself in the foot. Look at what you did. Why did you do that? 
not realizing that for black people in that community, the tire company was a site of injustice. The police regularly used it as a place to illegally and brutally interrogate prisoners in their custody. And so in the minds of people in that community, this was a site of, of devastation. And so given the opportunity to strike back, they set it on fire and burned it down. So you, you have to kind of change the vantage point through which you examine a lot of what's happening. I walked up to the street and I watched uh, buildings burn, cars turned over, rocks being thrown. People were really mad, really mad. And, and they said, this is for Mac Duffy, this is for Mac Duffy. It was written all over, everywhere. All over the walls, all, you know, everywhere. For Mac Duffy, for Mac Duffy. During the time of the riot, um, well, I was just arriving back from the trial, which was held in Tampa. I felt a little disappointed, no need to, but who are they to control someone else's feelings? My mama took it hard, she did. She, But she was a, was a strong woman in the law, and uh, even with the riot was going on, she told them to stop. And she told them that wasn't going to bring her son back. The toll was 18 people were killed. In the city of Miami, there were more than $100 million in property damage. We responded to in excess of 300 calls, fire calls. Buildings burnt out, burnt to the ground. Uh, and then you start thinking about the impact of that. The long-term devastation of the results of a riot. It was the community that I had worked um, as a rookie officer of the community that I had lived in as um, a young adult was just torn down, torn apart. Stores, stores that I had frequented when I patrolled the area and also just lived in the area were burning restaurants, businesses, and it sickened me um, because I realized that none of this was going to be replaced. We had some large businesses, as a matter of fact, in Liberty City at that time. Uh, not many of them were owned by blacks, but they did provide jobs. And not all of the jobs that blacks had in those businesses were necessarily many of the jobs. Uh, you had some black stores uh, that were beginning now uh, to uh, hire black cashiers, which had not been the case before. So uh, there was an upward mobility uh, of blacks uh, in Liberty City uh, prior to the riot, which stopped in the aftermath of that riot. The businesses left, the jobs left, uh, and they've not gone back, even now. I wasn't as aware that his death in his legacy and the, the, the civil services and the, the actions that came afterward has, has determined my path in life. I mean, there's absolutely no question about it. The place that I'm sitting now was founded based upon the opportunity that came about because of his death in the civil services and the 
political will of the black community afterwards. And it was a way of addressing economic and housing development in that community by supposedly the federal government, Jimmy Carter then, appropriating $89 million to come into Miami to go through community-based organizations to help revitalize those communities. The state legislature did fulfill this promise and appropriated about $10 million to fund um, and create a statute that, that actually um, recognized community development corporations and neighborhood development corporations. All of that money that was allocated and appropriated under Jimmy Carter, he lost the election in November. And so even though Congress had allocated it and it was ready and it was at HUD ready to come down here, first thing President Reagan did was freeze all spending. And so anything like that, you know, he had a Republican Congress, he did what this current president did was he cut it. And so we never got any federal assistance. And so what happened, you had all these community-based organizations that had got these administrative dollars to organize themselves and to hire staff, but the money that was supposed to come down for the economic development, the job training, the, the, the capital to start small businesses, the money to buy property and to build affordable housing, none of that came. You had these organizations sort of running around with, with resources to pay salary, but no resources to do anything else. Most folded after the first three or four years because there was just really no access to, to, to capital. So you had a community that had been starved by the riot, had lost jobs, had lost uh, important uh, uh, opportunities for advancing that community, uh, and this was replaced with an atmosphere of fear. You wouldn't want to be caught in the city after that riot. The sense was that if you were white or Hispanic, you would even be killed. And so it became a more isolated community as a result of what had happened. Uh, it just took time for people to simply get over the disappointment and the anger and the sadness about what had happened. But I don't think we ever came back together. The McDuffie case, the riots, the subsequent acquittals, it created a huge um, schism in Miami-Dade County. I mean, I think that Miami-Dade County thought that, that we were all right, that we were different, that we got along, that things were good. And the death of Mr. McDuffie and the subsequent riot showed that we were not good. We were, you know, things were not all right. Well, I think it's symptomatic of our country. I mean, we have a segregated past. We have issues in this country that we don't talk about. And uh, the things that we're going through today, you wouldn't believe it. You think things are changing, but somehow they seem to stay the same in the atmosphere we got right now. Just bring those feelings back to a certain degree. When you look at some of the things that, that happen in the black community, not everybody has an appreciation for why they're happening and why people might be upset about why they're happening, because they haven't experienced it. You know, it's something different for them. They're not close to it, so, you know, they get that attitude about, you keep it over there, don't bother us, do whatever you wanna do. That's why it's so important to do things to try to change that kind of thought process. Because the the, the fact of the matter is, Liberty City goes, so does Miami. You know, people look at something about Liberty City burning, but it represents Miami. And people have to understand that. So they got to be concerned about what happens everywhere and how it's affecting anybody. Totally false to say that that, that incident changed everything for the better because it hasn't you know it traumatized my family it's devastated my family incidents such as that keeps happening and even though it's not always in miami it's in our world today it's in different states it's in it's in different cities and it's affecting families and it's affecting people even when the incident happened in california with i believe rodney king it affected us in such a way because it just brought back so many feelings and so many just disheartening moments 
regarding my father and what he had to endure because we had to we had to just see that years later it's still happening in the world that we live in. I used to turn from it, but I don't anymore because it affects me, it affects my grandkids. Being young at that age, I was learning that those men, the police officer was the one that hurt my father. And my head at that young age was questioned, why? I questioned it to the age of 33 or 30, 33 years old. And at that time, I started getting closure. And the reason for being is because it wasn't nothing I could do about it but accept it. I was snatched out of public school and put in private schools because everywhere I went, everybody wanted questions and they wanted answers. And they was like, oh, look, that's, that's her. That's how we make that door. And so my mama felt like she had to, to hide me. I had to grow up really fast and I had to learn how to say I'm a different person other than what I was or who I was. So nobody went question me because people wanted to know. I didn't want them to know. I didn't want to talk about it because remember that was opening the pain. So it was times that I would say I'm somebody else and I'm not even that person. That was one of my things that I had to go through for therapy to really come to the real identity of myself again. My mom was depressed a lot. She was holding her head a lot. She started going to church. She started going to church real heavy real, real heavy. And it was so heavy till me and my sister, um, there was not an option that we could miss church. Just the fact of having to grow up without a father, you know, ministry has, has definitely kept our heads on intact. And it's allowed us to be brave and to be able to speak about it and to be able to share with the community and to share with one another how we feel and um, just to be an encouragement to people. God has taken my brokenness and made it whole, so I'm able to reach people in their brokenness and their despairs, and they're looking at me like, there is hope, there is hope, there is. What is it that America has failed to hear? has failed to hear that the plight of the Negro poor has worsened over the last few years. It has failed to hear that the promises of freedom and justice have not been met. And it has failed to hear that large segments of white society are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo than about justice, equality, and humanity. And so in a real sense, our nation summers of riots are caused by our nation's winters of delay. And as long as America postpones justice, we stand in the position of having these recurrences of violence and riots over and over again. Social justice and progress are the absolute guarantors of riot prevention.